greetings to those who are watching us and also those who will be watching us, uh, I hope, in the near future. Uh, our guest is uh, Bruce Perry. Uh, I will try to uh, share the screen about him. I think it's seen. Uh, our topic is the introduction to the neurosequential model. This is our 24th intergenerational meeting. Uh, Professor Bruce Perry is our guest. Uh, a few words about uh, the very brief CV of Prof, uh, Bruce Perry. Uh, I underline a brief, very brief, because if we would uh, go and listen to his original CV, the, the whole meeting would go uh, with that. He, he is the principal of the Neurosequential Network and the professor in the departments of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Finberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago and the School of Allied Health, College of Science, Health and Engineering at Trope University, Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. Uh, over the last 30 years, Dr. Perry has been an active teacher, clinician, and researcher in children's mental health and the neurosciences, holding a variety of academic positions. Of course, a very popular writer as well. His work on the impact of abuse, neglect, and trauma on the developing brain has impacted clinical practice, programs, and policy all the world, across the world. Dr. Perry is the author uh, with Maya Salavitz uh, of The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, a best-selling book based on his work with maltreated children, and Born for Love, Why Empathy is Essential and Endangered. Dr. Perry's most recent book, What Happened to You? Conversation on Trauma, Resilience, and Healing, co-authored with Oprah uh, Winfrey, was released in 2021. I'm especially very thankful uh, for my dear friend uh, to be with us. And I have uh, requested a few moments uh, from him. He agreed. Uh, today is a special day for uh, Turkey. Uh, the 10th of November, 2023 is the 85th year of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's passing away to the hearts and minds of Turkish people. He is the founder of the Republic of Turkey, for which this year we are celebrating the 100th year of anniversary. These are important events for us, and uh, I would like to, I wanted to share these with you. Uh, especially during the time, during cur current time, we have wars all around the world, especially in our area, and the most important words of uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk is peace at home, peace in the world. Uh, this was first pronounced by him on 20th April 1931. Peace at home, peace in the world. Uh, I would like to repeat, uh, this is a time when the whole world needs such a principle. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me share this, dear Bruce. I think that's a very, very appropriate and, and very powerful message. Um, so I, I, I'm honored to be here, honored to share some of our work. And um, I know that a lot of people will be seeing this uh, re recording. And uh, w what I'd like to say to start with is that I, I'm going to give a presentation, talk a little bit about the the evolution of our clinical model how how we actually are trying to approach clinical work and but i would like this to be as interactive as possible and and hopefully um we can have some conversations about some of the things that i bring up um certainly uh it's always a lot more fun to sit in on an, any kind of 
webinar when you can be part of it as opposed to just sitting and listening. So um, I I just want to uh, also say that just about anything that I talk about, uh, there are places online where you can learn more about it. So I'm going to share my screen right now and um, give you, uh, actually, I need to put those slides over here. Uh, I'm going to start with this slide that has some of the online locations for how you can get access to some of the content that I'm presenting. Um, just, I'm actually very, very happy to be able to, to continue in my relationship with colleagues in Turkey. Um, and, and we actually, some of the content that we have stored is, has been translated into Turkish a, a little bit, not a lot. And some of the other materials that we have, we, we have a couple of webinars and a, a couple of uh, clinical conversations that we have recorded in English and in Turkish. So uh, there are there will be a growing catalog of content that is uh, added to that all the time. And so probably the, 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 this is one useful place to start. The other place is that there is a subsection of the on this website that has <clears throat> a number of translated materials so if you want more uh, access to more information about some of the things i talk about that's probably the best place to start the, the other thing you can do is just directly send us an email you know we have a we we, we have a really responsive clinical team a real uh, a very responsive administrative team and we will a lot of times we may not be able to answer your questions, but we'll certainly uh, try to direct you to uh, individuals who can. So let me start back. <laughs> it all started back in a one-room shack in a small town in North Dakota. Um, I, I What I want to talk about really is it's uh, the neural sequential model or NMT. Um, and that's sort of a very complicated label. And I'll, I'll get to the uh, point of explaining that in a minute. But I, what I really want to do, because I think a lot of the, many of the people listening to this will be students and uh, young developing clinicians. And what I want to talk about is the, the process of inventing where we are now started when I was a student. And I want to talk about that process because I want to make people feel empowered that and, and recognize that you are not just an empty vesicle that is going to absorb everything everybody tells you and then just do everything you're told to do. I want you to recognize that it, it is part of our, our our species is part of humanity to take in what we're exposed to and then manipulate it <clears throat> in ways that hopefully will improve things for the next generation. We are an inventing species. We, we have this incredible gift in in parts of our brain that allow us to take, internalized content, things that we've learned, language, images, concepts, and and play with them in our head. And out of that process of <clears throat> reflecting on experience, thinking about what you just learned in history class, how does that fit with my own experience? Does that make sense to me? Uh, it, it's part of the makeup of human beings to tinker, to, to play with things and invent things. Now, that inventing process, we end up calling social cultural evolution. Um, so there's all kinds of things that humankind has invented. We've invented language. We've invented, you know, models of governance. We've invented um 
technologies that allow us to talk across the planet in real time. I mean, it's pretty crazy that I'm talking to you and you're in Turkey. And it's even crazier that that's going to be recorded. And 100 years from now, somebody's going to be able to watch that. It, that's a pretty you know mind-boggling concept when you actually sit down and think about it. But it's even more mind-boggling when you think about 5,000 years ago, or let's say let's let's say eight, ten thousand years ago, humankind had not even invented written language. That's just that's crazy. So one of the great gifts about this brain, and I'm I'm going to talk about this a little bit. Is it, you know, this is a this is a drawing of the brain. This really isn't the brain, as you all know. This is a drawing of the brain. We've all seen a million versions of this. And uh, I came into clinical training after becoming a neuroscientist. I went and studied the brain, studied the neurosciences, studied set neur neurons and everything. And uh, I, I saw millions of versions of these and and literally worked with with hundreds and hundreds of human brains that were real human brains. And <clears throat> one of the fundamental things that I was taught that I didn't, and I know you all were taught the same thing, but I didn't really think about the implications of what I was taught uh, until I started to do clinical work. And let me just tell you this simple principle simple concrete reality of the anatomy of the brain. There's a bottom and there's a top. I know that sounds crazy, but, but that's pretty important. It turns out to be really important. There's a lower part of the brain. It's the brainstem. And then there's the top part of the brain. You know, you, we've got everybody, we've all learned about this. This is the cortex. Now, we, we all learned also, <clears throat> all of us who became physicians, learned that as part of the physical examination, the routine physical examination we give people is that we have them track, have their eyes follow our finger. We look at extraocular eye movement, right? And up and down. And we have somebody stick their tongue out. <clears throat> and we say, ah, and we, we have them bite down. And then we feel them swallow. You all know that what we're looking at we're trying to get some understanding of how their brainstem is organized because the cranial nerves that control all those actions originate from the brainstem. <clears throat> so that learning was something that was very, very, turns out to be very, very important in understanding behavior. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one second while I cough. I'm sorry. So I'll come back and, talk about that that in a minute but but at when when we were training and and when you were training you can remember this we were just bombarded with factoids you know we learned about the cranial nerves and what they did and all that kind of stuff but we never we rarely had sort of an integrating synthesizing exposure to the fundamental architecture of the brain and so the the, the fundamental architecture of the brain is that there is a bottom and there's a top. And the consequence of that is you cannot get to the top part of the brain. <clears throat> you can't get to the cortex without going through the middle part of the brain. And related to that, we all learned this neuroanatomically, every single thing that you touch, every, every single sensory input, touch, sound, sight, has its first stop in either low, middle, or lower parts of the brain. All sensory input comes into the lower part of the brain. Now, some olfactory input comes into sort of the limbic cortical thing, but that's the highest part. That's that's the highest direct sensory input to the whole body, to the whole brain, is from olfaction. Everything else comes in to parts of the brain lower than that. I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> so I was filled with all of these, if you will, factoids about how the brain is organized, how the brain works. And I ended up, you know, I studied the development of these really important uh, 
core regulatory networks that were starting in lower parts of the brain. Here's the, like the locus ceruleus, which is the largest norepinephrine containing nucleus in the body. So I was studying the locus ceruleus. I was studying the substantia nigra. I was studying dopamine, serotonin, opioid, neur neural neurons, and migrate, all this stuff. Very, very um, micro analysis of the brain. And so by the time I started to do clinical work, I knew this. <clears throat> I knew that there were component parts of the brain that made it ungodly complex. I mean, it really is incredibly complex. And I also knew it was even more complex because I was working, I could take one of these cells, one of these neurons, literally one, one monoclonal, you know, cell line that was exactly one cell. And we had complexities in studying how that cell worked and developed and migrated that were that kept large research labs busy for years so if we were studying the migration and the innervation of one neur one neuron what does that say when you've got 86 billion basically that says that, that the brain's complicated and complex and the reality is every time somebody tries to explain it and every time somebody tries to talk about how the brain works or what part of the brain does what and all that kind of stuff, we're basically making estimates. We're, we're summarizing. We're using heuristics to capture complexity. And that's that was something that I was very well aware of when I started to do clinical work. So here I come in and I'm, as you all did, all of you who are, who are trained, I came in <clears throat> and I was given a whole list of patients. And one patient had attention problems, another patient had schizophrenia and hallucinations. Uh, another patient, lots of patients had post-traumatic stress disorder because I worked in the US VA system. And so all of these people had these labels. And I was a, I was a good boy. You know, I kind of did what I was told to do. I looked at their symptoms and I kind of pulled out the book and I said, okay, you have this and you have this. And then, so you have ADHD and oh, what do we do with people that have ADHD? Uh, well, we prescribe Ritalin or we sort of talk to the parents about discipline or whatever. And, and the other thing was how often do I see you to help you change? Oh, I see you once a week for an hour. And I'm somehow supposed to change, you, you do something with you in this moment <clears throat> that changes you, that makes you better capable of paying attention, that makes you less depressed, that makes you understand and, and not get overwhelmed by your, your hallucinations. And that was giving me an incredible responsibility. And it, the tacit message was also that I had a lot of power. I mean, think about it. Think about a discipline where you think that you can take a child who's been abused, neglected, uh, marginalized, humiliated, has caregivers and, and and who don't understand him, and then has classmates that treat him poorly, and then he's supposed to, you're supposed to have one hour a week where you are supposed to take care of that. That's a little arrogant. <laughs> And I, I just started to struggle with our conventional medical model. And so the first place that I, that I just kind of started to do the math was that I'd been studying the development of these really, really important neurotransmitter networks that were in the lower part of the brain. And, you know, the model that I used to sort of talk to parents or teach to parents was I, I would basically take an upside down triangle i'd say listen here's here's a diagram of the brain okay think about this this is i want what i'm trying to help you understand is that you know when billy has sleep problems and when he has social problems and when he has speech and language problems and when he has difficulties with learning to read and when he has uh, inappropriate attention and when he actually has asthma and and high resting heart rate 
instead of saying that he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight disorders, there's got to be some, is there, is there some unifying factor? And so here's what I had been studying. I'd been studying these core regulatory networks that were originating in the lower part of the brain. Norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, and acetylcholine. You guys have heard of all of these things. And I've been studying them. I've been studying their development. I've been studying the role they play in development. I've been studying how they migrate, how they send out axonal projections. I've been studying the synaptic dynamics. And so I knew a lot about development. And I knew, oh, you know what? There's There are these systems that actually are influential in all of these problem areas that you've been having. In fact, we know that the locus ceruleus is involved in sleep and attention and plays a role in uh, forming and maintaining relationships and can influence speech and language and will influence the, cap the capacity to attend and focus, which is related to the capacity to learn how to read. And oh, by the way, it also plays a role in respiration and cardiovascular regulation. So I think it's more likely, you know, if just pure logic, I think it's more likely that there's something wrong with this system than with eight different systems. And so that's that started to occur to me. And we were studying this, and I had a laboratory where we were studying this in tissue culture. We were studying sort of these, these cells in animal models. And then I was in the clinical world. And I'd see kids with sleep problems, startle response, inability to attend, high resting heart rate. And they were given these labels, ADHD, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I started to think, is this the right way to do this? Is, is this the right way to make sense out of what I'm seeing? So I started to do a little bit of math, right? I like math. So here's what I did. I the, the six months prior to going and starting my psychiatry residency, I'd been in the working in a regular medical clinic, like all of you guys probably did your medical training before you went into psychiatry. So I knew, for example, after being in the cardiac intensive care unit for four months, that there were dozens and dozens and dozens of cardio, you know, cardiac diseases. And, and there were big cardiac textbooks that had all kinds of specific problems. And then I started to go, well, wait a minute, the heart's, <clears throat> what does the heart do? The heart pumps blood, which is not very complicated. I know it's a wonderful thing. I'm glad it does it. But it's compared to what the brain does, the heart's got a couple functions, just a couple functions, and it's got a very simple structure. Yet if you open up a cardiac textbook, you're going to have dozens and dozens and dozens of unique, distinctive cardio, cardiac you know, problems. Furthermore, if you sort of then look at the symptoms of the card, all these different cardiac problems, they have the same symptom clusters, right? Shortness of breath, you know, episodic chest pain. Um, it's it's not like the symptoms were necessarily distinguishing what the disorder was. So so there was something that we call uh, equi equifinality, which means that you end up having the same problems, but you come from all different directions. This is a really powerful and important concept in development. And so there's equifinality and there are other factors involved in trying to understand what you're looking at. And so I started to look at, all right, well, what's going on? How many disorders are present in our public mental health clinics? And I started to see, got it again and again and again and again and again, ADHD, ADHD, conic disorder, conic disorder, rule out depression. I started to see clusters of, you know, maybe eight of our DSM labels that captured 90% of our kids. And most of these kids got multiple labels. And so what I realized was if you've got all kinds of different complexities in the way your brain is organized, 
Yet somehow when these systems don't work properly, we, we put everything into these same boxes. What I realized was that <clears throat> we were making a mistake. So I'm going to just show you a series of, 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 uh, I'm in a series of slides. I'll come back and we can talk about this a little bit. But one of the things that we, what I recognized early on is that we really needed to have a systematic way to look at large populations of children. Because if you do the math, if you do the simple math about what's the the power required to do, um, you know, to really tease out causality in humans around behavior, you get to end numbers of 10,000, 50,000. And this has been a problem for neuroimaging. We can talk about that in a minute. But so what I realized was we have to somehow come up with a way to systematically do assessments that are clinically practical, but also add to our knowledge base. And, and, and it was a very aspirational and almost hopeless effort because right now, most research done in childhood and adolescent mental health has ends of 50 or 100 or 200. And we make huge program policy and practice decisions based upon these underpowered inadequate studies. And so the truth is we don't have a very big evidence base in child psychiatry. We have a lot of tantalizing little studies, but we don't have a lot of, of adequately powered studies. So I realized that we had we have to figure out a way to do this better. And this is something that our field continues to struggle with. The head of our NIMH, Tom Insel, many, a couple of years back, uh, basically, during the revision of the DSM to become the now the current DSM, basically said, listen, the DSM is not the direction to go, particularly for research, because it's not valid. There's no validity to the labels. And I know I feel like I'm kicking a beehive to my colleagues in psychiatry, but the reality is, a hundred years from now, people are going to laugh at us and say, I can't believe that they actually use this to, to frame their clinical approaches to people around mental health. They're just going to go, This is, it doesn't make any sense. And so this is why people have been developing <clears throat> the RDOC criterion. And to create, it's rather than a le single label, to create a matrix to basically put somebody within a three-dimensional matrix so that they you can cluster them more adequately to study them. And that's... And that's a, similar to what we've been doing. So we developed a, a, an assessment process that's <clears throat> looking at a number of factors that we think are important in playing a role in shaping current functioning. <clears throat> and this is a report that comes from that process, which we can talk about a little bit more in a second. But the reason I want to show this to you is that... <clears throat> We have a series of over 500 individuals where we have uh, neuroimaging. We, we've looked at uh, using spec scanning to look at different parts of the brain, how they're active or overactive, underactive. And then we've compared that with a model, this reconstruction of functional uh, organization of the brain that we've created as part of this approach. Now, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. So really what I want you to pay attention to in this series of slides is that all of these kids were given the same DSM labels, <clears throat> but they have different developmental histories and they have different functional organization and they have different changes in their brain. Basically the point is to show you that our labels are over clustering people. This is one of the reasons so many of our outcome studies are so mixed up and replication is so challenging because we're looking at heterogeneous samples if we cluster them based upon diagnosis. So <clears throat> basically what you're looking at here is different views of a spec scan where anything that's not gray is at least one standard deviation either more active or less active 
than a huge population of neurotypicals. So here's this child. And 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 this is using our model. And bottom line is just sort of focus. Don't, don't really focus on what's down here yet, but focus on sort of the, the neuroimaging. So that's different. This kid has the same labels, different child, slightly different developmental history, different changes in the brain. This child has same labels, different developmental history, different brain map. And I could do this for, we've done this with over 5,000 comparisons. <clears throat> the bottom line is that the brain is so incredibly complex that we really need to step back from these over-inclusive labels if we're going to study things. So that's where we developed th this, th the approach that we have. Um, part of the idea was, <clears throat> the challenge was, first of all, what do you measure? You know, what's worth measuring? Because what we wanted to do is have a huge database where we were measuring meaningful items that might help us on better understand current functioning in a variety of domains, particularly domains relevant to people in mental health. So cognition, social functioning, motor fine motor control, and so forth. So here's a couple of things that we knew were important. <clears throat> One, we know that the time that experience is important. L let me just go back to that because I think all of you know uh, about the ACE studies, right? The adverse childhood experience, epidemiological studies. We, we've known this for years and then other people have been studying this, but we know that if you have significant chaos, threat, distress, it influences your, your cognitive, social, physiological, emotional functioning. So, you know, we post-traumatic stress disorder is an example. But we also knew that if those chaotic, you know, it, traumatic experiences happened early in development, that that was going to have a more catastrophic impact on your outcomes. And we knew this from animal studies. We knew this from our work in, uh, with children exposed to abuse and neglect. So we felt that if you want to understand the current functioning of a person, let's say you take an adult, <clears throat> that their early developmental experiences and their developmental trajectory of positive and negative experiences will, will be important in defining how they're, how they're currently functioning. So if you look, for example, at <clears throat> time, here's, here's time, this axis right here, and here's three different kids that, that kind of start with a genetic cluster that would place them either in the hardy resilient category or in sort of the dysregulated vulnerable category. Because we know that there are there there are genetic factors that influence a lot of these characteristics that have to do with sensory processing and managing these the development of these systems. But we also know that there are epigenetic factors that will influence which genes get turned on, which genes get, don't get turned on. And we also know there are intrauterine factors that are independent of genetics. So intrauterine alcohol, that's going to be not good for anybody on intrauterine other meth, intrauterine stress and distress of the mother. So we know that there's all kinds of things that will shift the expression of your genetic potential. Just as we know that early life <clears throat> interactions with your caregiving environment will really determine the set point of your stress response system. So we, we know all of these factors, stre life stressors, adverse experiences, we know that these things all can play a role in your life course. So we may end up looking at a child, two kids right here, who have exactly the same capacity to regulate. And they'll have the same impulsivity, the same inattention, the same, you know, you know, as we look at them, they'll look very similar with regard to these traits, but they have completely different trajectories to that point. <clears throat> and what that really means is because of that, you're they're going to require individualized, different interventions. 
you'll do different things with this person, the blue person, than the than the red triangle. And so that's part of what we're trying to uh, figure out. What what should we measure? Now, <clears throat> the the we knew that we should look at adversity. And we knew we should look at the timing of adversity because, you know, the malleability of the human brain changes dramatically as you get older. So we're much more vulnerable early in life than we are later in life. So we wanted to look at adversity in a developmental way, right? The timing of adversity, intrauterine, first two months of life, first year of life, and so forth. These, because we know that that's, those are meaningful factors. The second thing that we knew was very important was relationships. So if you, this is from a study that with, oops, this is from a study <clears throat> that we did with the ACE, with these folks, uh, the, the ACE uh, Adverse Childhood Experience team. And the red lines are mine. I put these in based on our other work, but this is, the common finding, which you all are familiar with, I'm sure, that the number of adversities that you have before 17, and these were the common things that people asked about, these 10 adversities, if they're present, just very simply, very categorically, epidemiological, non-clinical tool, um, but if you have these things, that increases your developmental risk. So if you have four of these things, uh, you're at risk for exhibiting almost three significant uh, adult life problems, substance abuse, depression, divorce, whatever, physical health, mental health, social health problems. And you guys have heard this story, I'm sure, a million times. But what I kept trying to tell my colleagues in that in that team, I said, listen, we can't look just at the bad things. We have to look at the counterbalancing connectedness. And so one of the things that we felt was very important to look at and in incorporate into our assessment was relational health. So here's basically what we found is if you take <clears throat> a, a group of adults who have adversities, but you also look at their connection to family, community, and culture, that's basically something that can buffer the adversity. Sorry, I keep bouncing around here. My cursor is going crazy. Similarly, and so when, when if somebody really has connection, healthy community, healthy family, they can have up to four of these adversities before they demonstrate any risk. In contrast, if you are relationally impoverished, if you're not connected in a healthy way to family or community or culture, in the absence of adversities, you're at risk for some of these adult poor outcomes, which is something that all clinicians have seen. We've all seen this. We've all seen the power of connection to community, culture, family, and so forth. And so when we developed this assessment model, this is kind of what we, uh, and believe me, we, we went through many iterations and, and had lots of uh, mistakes. But we ultimately got to the point where we, want, we wanted to have a <clears throat> clinically useful, practical assessment process that gave the clinical team or the clinician useful information about how to do their work but also was gathered in a standardized way and archived online so that we could create a data set from all over the world, which we, we now have. We have uh, over 100,000 uh, assessments uh, across the entire developmental uh, span where we're looking at all of these factors. And so <clears throat> the way we... What this looks like is that people get uh, trained. There, there's a capacity building process. They learn about the rationale, the reasoning behind why we, we pick these things. We teach them about how to use this online tool. Um, people get an account. And then they get, there's a semi-structured interview process 
uh, that walks them through uh, gathering all of this history. And so we look at the, the, the nature and the severity and the timing of adversity and the nature and the timing and the severity of relational buffering factors. And so we're able to get in, in this sort of linear picture of developmental risk. Now, I know you may not be able to see this very well, but this is the intrauterine period right here. The green is the presence of positive relational connectivity, you know, relational health. The red is the presence of adversity. And when you sort of balance the adversity versus connectivity, you get an estimate of developmental risk. And that's what this curve is. So this child, for up until you know early childhood, had high developmental risk, and then was either, I'm not sure exactly what happened. It might have been this child was removed, or this child got, something happened, uh, where that risk shifted. Now, really, what developmental risk means in the way we think about it is that you are in an environment that is insufficiently providing the nature, the pattern, and the quality of experiences required to express your potential. And, and so you're just going to developmentally get behind. <clears throat> now, the second part of this assessment is that we took that upside down triangle brain thing, you know, that I showed you before, and, you know, our overly simplistic working version of the brain, you know, We've got this <clears throat> this thing where we um, <clears throat> try to teach people about, all right, lower parts of the brain have neural networks that regulate temperature and blood pressure. And as you get higher in the brain, there are networks that are involved in forming and maintaining relationships and finally get to the top part of your brain, the most uniquely human part of your brain, where these neural networks are involved in speech and language and planning and thinking and your ability to tell time and all that kind of stuff. So we we tell people about this, but what we've done functionally with this these maps <clears throat> is that we are using the maps, <clears throat> we use function to basically create a heuristic of how we think the brain is organized. Now, and again, every when when you do, for example, uh, WISC, you know, IQ testing, you're getting some understanding or some snapshot of how the cortex appears to be organized. When you do a trauma symptom checklist for children, you're getting information about different parts of the brain. And so basically what we did is we put together a a set of questions that allow us to completely fill in and make an estimate of how well the brain is organized. And so <clears throat> it, at birth, what we know is that the cortex is undeveloped. You know, a newborn can't really do speech and language. A newborn, you know, they, they're not involved in complex abstract reflection. But they are beginning to regulate their body in a way that is approximating adult. And so as you get older, you know, by the time you're one, your brainstem's kind of like an adult brainstem. Your cortex, you're beginning to develop some social capabilities, some fine motor, some large motor capabilities. And as you as you know, the brain develops in the bottom up and the inside out. We've got this whole set of neurotypical maps, which we can then compare <clears throat> to kids that are presenting clinically. So this nine-year-old child, for example, should look like this, but they don't. They look like this, which basically over time, you learn how to read this. This child has a sensitized stress response system, and they have profound problems with attachment and forming and maintaining relationships. And which is makes complete sense considering their developmental history, where there was chaos, neglect, overwhelmed caregiving, exposure to threat, and so forth. 
And so we've been using these these maps. <clears throat> Excuse me. To do our clinical treatment planning. And um, what we recognize is that we need, in, in the process of doing our treatment, we need to recognize that we have to select and sequence therapeutic activities that are going to is basically help fill in these developmental or organizational gaps. And that even though we may want, there may be un, problems in the cortex, you, you can't address problems in cortical organization and functioning until you've addressed functioning in lower parts of the brain. And that's because <clears throat> these lower parts of the brain are continually providing input to these higher parts of the brain. So one of the common mistakes we make in a lot of our therapeutic work and, and in a lot of our parenting, a lot of our coaching, a lot of our communicating is that we're trying to directly engage the limbic and cortical parts of the brain while the lower parts of the brain are still wildly out of control. And so if you take a child who has trauma-related dysregulation of, of these systems and they have reading problems, but you then send them to a, a tutor, that's not going to work very well. And clinically, this is what we see time and time and time again. Speech and language, uh, educational tutors, learning social skills, all of those activities really don't go well until you've helped somebody develop fundamental regulatory capabilities. And so we have what we call the sequence of engagement. If you really want to get to the cortex and influence the cortex as a teacher, a coach, a parent, um, the best way to do that is to make somebody feel connected and safe. And the best, and, and that is not going to be possible unless there's some minimal degree of regulation. Now, this is a, an overly simplistic heuristic, um, but we use it all the time uh, to help people understand that if you get out of sequence when you're doing this work, in, when you're trying to communicate with somebody, you're not going to be effective. And so th there's a, um, there are a lot of different aspects to the application and, and uh, use of this model, but let me just give you a tiny little um, picture of how we've been implementing this. So we introduced this many, many years ago. And um, we first manualized this treatment approach in 2008. And since that time, we've trained uh, people all over the world. Um, we now have an on, our, our core data set has about 100,000 uh, individual cases. Um, we're, we're, we have certified clinicians all over the world. Um, we actually have a few folks in Turkey who are interested in becoming certified. And we will be starting a, a cohort where colleagues uh, from Turkey and probably some of our other colleagues from Italy uh, and Poland who want to become certified will be going through the process. But... <laughs> May I, may I say one thing? Here, yes. uh, among our uh, listeners, we have a friend from Malaysia, uh, one from uh, Pakistan, and one from US. So uh, it's not only Turkish uh, students or Turkish graduates. I just wanted to underline this. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, and believe me, we. We would welcome anybody who wants to learn more about this. We're we're very um, <clears throat> we have a lot of colleagues in New Zealand and Australia, and in, and as you can imagine, the the countries that are English speaking, it's easier for them to uh, to do this. But we are working with our colleagues in a lot of other settings to translate and create a transitional process where some content is in English and, and then we slowly translate the content into the the language of the the that clinician's 
homeland. Um, and so we're doing we're we've been doing that um, with a couple of different uh, communities, and we've we've been in conversation with people in Turkey about doing that as well. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of different. I brought up all kinds of stuff, and I was jumping all over the place. But I I do want to say that one of the things that we have been um, very, I guess, optimistic about is that the more people that have been applying this model and getting quality data, the more people uh, are interested in it. And we've had tremendous success in particularly with externalizing symptoms, you know, impulsivity, aggression, um, we've decreased restraints in clinical settings. We've led, to, <clears throat> we, we've been doing this in adult populations and in public mental health clinics. We just got data from one of our our county uh, colleagues in uh, California, where they've been using it this model in their adult population and seeing success in patients that had been warehoused for years, and. Um, there are a lot of different aspects to this that I, I, I think um, probably is be more helpful to all of you if we talk, have more conversational um, you know, questions and I can answer questions you may have about some of this stuff. Because it's um, <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, different aspects to the work that we're doing that <clears throat> may be of interest to you. Um, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions about the model or um, or the principles underneath the model uh, if you're interested in it. Uh, y yes. I, I, I would like to, oh, oh probably Roshita can go first. She raised her hand first. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for this um, introduction, first of all. I would like to ask, I mean, I got a very basic approach of this uh, model, but I'm wondering about the application, how it is different from today's um, therapeutic approach. I mean, yeah. uh, well, you said, yeah, maybe we are referring more to cortex, maybe today's um, medications, but, but how is how your approach is different in the application? That's a, that's a really good question. And I, I, I'm at the cough again here, so. Excuse me. So in some ways it's, this is a model that we do use in a conventional mental health clinic. In an unconventional medical model clinic, what is different is that we view the the physician or the primary clinician who's doing this not as the individual who will be doing all of the therapeutic work, but we that person ends up playing a role as kind of the conductor of an orchestra. Um, we engage people in the life of the client. You know that we we look the first thing we do in treatment planning is look at what we call the therapeutic web like what who are all the people in that person's life who can potentially be helpful in making them feel safe making them feel rewarded making them feel supported and then we play a big we will try to get everybody engaged and aware of what the needs of this person are, what the strengths of this person are, uh, and mobilize the community, basically. And then we go, the second phase of treatment planning for us is then to do that same process with the family. You know, frequently, particularly with children and youth, you can know exactly what to do with the child. But if the family is not able to do that, and if the family is overwhelmed and their fundamental needs aren't being met, it, it just, you know, one hour a week with you is not going to be enough to sort of help this child. So we that this is where we go. And, you know, on that first level, that therapeutic web, one of the key things for children is the school. We engage the school. And and we and 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 think about, all right, do you, 
Do you like sport? Do you like music? Do you like drama? We try to get them connected into healthy settings. And as we come into the family, what we run into is that, wow, mom's depressed. Mom's on her own. And, you know, we can say all these things about how mom should help this child or interact in a certain way. But if mom's needs aren't met, we're just, you know, we're going to be ineffective. So we have a very active family engagement part as well. And then once we get to the third part of treatment planning is to then start with the child. And we look at this map and we go, all right, he's got problems with speech and language. He can't read very well. He's got social skills problems, but he's also can't sleep, increased startle response. He's impulsive. He's aggressive. He's got an overly reactive stress response system. So what we need to do is put together a plan that's going to reach those parts of the brain. And so we'll be very, we'll sort of put to the side speech and language, reading teacher, social skills class, things that could help him if he was regulated. And we'll focus on regulation. So we'll build in a regulation plan. And how do you get regulated? Well, it's not going to happen if you just do something once a week. We have to look at dosing and spacing. How do we look at this kid's week, you know, from the morning till night? What's a regulating strategy so that every hour he gets six minutes of this. Or, and, and so we proactively keep him regulated instead of using these regulation strategies to, to get him back to this baseline that he has. Because this is what we do with most of these strategies in school and other places. Billy blows up, then we send him off to some place to get regulated and then bring him back to class. So we we are trying to create proactive regulatory strategies. And <clears throat> and this is where the NME part of our training comes in. If the school understands this, then they're tremendously helpful in, in creating that. But if they don't understand why you're making these recommendations, they just think you're crazy. And they think that, oh, he's just trying to get out of work. He's just this or that. But once you explain to them and they understand it, and then they start to have success, um, then they buy in. I mean, I, I'm not going to, I could show you, but, you know, we have schools that we worked with that had 500 uh, referrals a month for discipline to the, to the principal. And once they learn a little bit about these concepts and once they build in these regulatory strategies, they get down to three or four a month and it completely changes the environment in the school. The teachers like to be there. The students like to be there. These kids that were performing in the fifth, sixth, seventh percentile based on national testing, a year later, they're in the 45th percentile. So they're they're back at the norm. And so and I, I don't want to make it sound like this is all miraculous, but the strategy is, it is really to externalize the therapeutic world, right? that recognizing that most therapeutic change happens in these little moment to moment interactions in the community and with people who know you, with your grandma, with your grandpa, with your coach, with your friends. And if they understand you, if there's some understanding about that's shared in that environment about why Billy is this way, rather than being punitive and hostile and excluding somebody, They'll learn how to be a little bit patient and a, and a little bit, you know, they'll learn that said that saying calm down is not the way to help a kid calm down. Um, they'll learn that, all right, what, the, oddly enough, when he starts to escalate, what I really should do is lower my voice and back up as opposed to step forward and wag my finger. And so when you learn these strategies and you learn a little bit about why, and then people have success. They're like, wow, this really does work. Then it kind of takes off. And you see these really, not always, but you see tremendous um, shifts in, in how things go. So the, the role of the clinician, we actually think, we want you to start thinking about that you're creating a symphony of intervention for this child, but you're not going to play any of the instruments. You're the conductor of the orchestra. You just need to make sure everybody is playing at the right time in the right way on the same sheet. And that's your role. You help them write the sheet music. You give everybody the same sheet music. And then you orchestrate and direct that therapeutic process. 
And it really, it's a kind of a shift. I mean, it's one of the things that was, and some of you may have seen this, some of you may have not. I'm going to change, show you something that that has reinforced our <clears throat> thoughts about why this shift is so important. And um, I don't want this one. I don't want this one. I don't want this one. I want. I want this one. All right. And I think, Bjorlund, you've seen this maybe. Um, oh, this isn't it. Sorry. I apologize. It's this one. So one of the things that we have learned to do <clears throat> is that after all of our experiences with these high-profile disasters, school shootings, you know, children seeing their parents get murdered, um, the earthquake in Turkey, right? We we have learned that there is a graded risk depending upon how proximal you are to the traumatic event. And this is not just from our work, it's from lots of other people have sort of found similar things. But bottom line is that the people that are directly witnessing, like if you have two kids that see their parents, you know, dad comes in, shoots mom, and then commit suicide in front of these kids, they're going to have a pretty high risk for a mental health need. And the people that clean up that living room and the people that are direct relatives of those dead parents are also going to be at risk, right? This is going to have impact on everybody. And, and there's this sort of echo out from that, that ground zero. So if you start to do the math, right? Let's say that you're in Chicago and there's a school shoot, or there's a, not a school shooting. There's a shooting with, uh, in a household, and two kids see it, and but then there's grandma, grandparents, and friends, and colleagues, and then there's extended family and classmates and coworkers, and you, you get to the point basically where you can predict that at least 250 people are going to be profoundly impacted by that event, to the degree that they would benefit from mental health services. And if we use our conventional medical model, here's the dilemma. One hour a week for these 250 people means that you have to have 12 clinicians spending half their time just to meet the needs of these people for this one event. And in Chicago, this happens three or four times a weekend. So we just do not have the capacity, even if this was the best way to help them, it's, it, it's impossible even in a well-resourced environment, like, you know, in the middle of the United States and in, in a rich state, if you get one school shooting, you've got 5,000 people conservatively that would benefit from therapy. That means you have to have 235 clinicians or spend half of their time. And as you guys know, nobody has 20 hours free every week to add on a new clients. Nobody has that. So part of what we're faced with is that we need to better understand uh, how to recognize the therapeutic experiences that are available and present in the real world of a person. What's, this is the power of culture. This is the power of family. That for all, for eons, for all of history, human beings have, have lived through traumatic experiences. And and if you're con what we know from our research and from what all, all kinds of other people have looked at this as well, if you are connected to other people, if there's good social cohesion, if there's extended family present, if you are connected to your belief system, that buffers you from stressors. That helps protect you, and it provides a healing environment. <clears throat> now, I didn't talk about it, but you know the fundamental role of, of this approach is to recognize that stress in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's the pa pattern of stress. <clears throat> and the biggest thing that we need to get the, use these sort of community and, and, and cultural interventions is figuring out ways to get stressors from being unpredictable to being a little bit more predictable develop some therapy some approaches to teach people how to moderate 
the, their extreme overactivations, right? This is where sort of mindfulness and exercise and, and dance and music, things that are out there in the world, they can make you feel more regulated. They can help moderate your stress response, but you need to use them. And then we need to help people <clears throat> remember and return to some sense of agency. There are things that you can control, even in the midst of what's going on. Let's say that you're one of these families impacted by what's going on in Gaza. As, as horrible as it is in, in that moment, there are things that you can control. And, and what happens is you things are always worse if you get this sense of helplessness and you just literally drift through the day. And But there are things that are controlled. And, and this is a big part of what we need to understand is that we, we, we're going to have to invent, uh, or, or should I say, we are going to have to return to taking advantage of our traditional community, cultural elements of health. And, and they need to, and those, those elements need to be educated and enriched and informed by us, right? That's our role. We have knowledge about stress. We have knowledge about mental health challenges. We have knowledge about how to develop strategies to help people. But instead of doing that in a compartmentalized, invisible way in an office away from everybody else that's that's logistically difficult and expensive, we need to get into the community and we need to be recruiting the community and enriching the community about these concepts so that they can become our co-therapists. Anyway, I'm rambling. Sorry. That's like you can, one one question and I'm off on a tangent. Sorry. I don't know if that that made any sense to you, but that's kind of what we're thinking about. Yes, thank you. Well, we conclude. May I ask you, you at the beginning said that uh, it might be uh, there may be uh, ways to uh, continue this uh, training in a way. Uh, yeah. What should the second step be for those uh, friends of us and for those uh, who will be watching this? I'm I'm glad you asked that. Um, here's what I think we should do, and I'll and I'll talk with you and Aishin about this. That there are four, five, six. Um, individuals who have expressed interest uh, about getting certified. Um, and what I would like to do is maybe is sometime in the next three, four, five weeks, um, let people that have shown interest know that we're going to have a meeting and, and we're going to have a Zoom meeting for anybody interested in this. We'll have some conversation about what the process is like, and then we can plan together what would be a convenient way to 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 do that now the the model we have for certification it's uh it's all it's web based it's uh archived online there are some live meetings you know but it doesn't require travel it doesn't require big blocks of time and and we've created it that way on purpose because we know everybody's working hard, you know, and everybody is resource limited. So we've tried to make the training process uh, digestible, you know, in little bits. But also we try to create a community of learners where people come together and and talk with each other and uh, help each other um, sort of share their experience and insights. And so there's... The majority of it is online, you know, and then an archived, and you can take part in it as you see fit. And then the other parts are these live small group study groups that we can set up. And but we can talk about that. That's that's kind of what I'd like to do is sometime in the next month, uh, sort of contact all the folks that are interested in this and say, this is you know, if you're interested, this is the way it's going to go, and let's go ahead and put together a, a, a group that is wants to make that commitment because it takes a lot of time. I mean, we think it's worth it, but it's, you know, it's a professional development experience. 
It's not just 10 hours or 20 hours. It's like 140 hours, but we spread it out over 10 modules that are pretty clearly delineated. It's manualized and, and we spread it out over, you know, a year basically. So you can use the, the, the metrics and you use what you're learning as you go, but we don't want to overwhelm people with too much too soon. So that's that's kind of the next step. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have passed over one hour. And uh, ah, you are sorry. very... No, no, not for us. For you. Uh, you have squeezed programs, I'm sure. Uh, would any one of uh, our attenders like to say very short thing to uh, Dr. Perry before we leave him. I, Raman, you had a question, I, I think. Uh, I, I actually did, but uh, I, I think since we're pressed for time, probably we can have a second session or a discussion for another day. I, I was just wondering about uh, if, you know, if our, I mean, this model could be extrapolated into the adult population uh, yeah. But I think you you sort of addressed it as well. I think. Yeah. No, I'm glad you asked that because it, it, we we do use it in in adults, and in fact, um, two days yesterday, I got uh, feedback from our colleagues in San Mateo County, where they used it in their adult mental health clinic and their their child and adolescent mental health clinic, and they, again, they, you know, they are very pleased with the progress that they see. In part because a lot of the adults, as you well know, that we work with in, in adult mental health, really had hard starts in life. And many of them are 35 years old chronologically, but they're like 12-year-olds in, in their social skills, or you know, they have they have splintered development. So if you're able to sort of use this map to figure out that I know you're 35, but look at this, this is kind of undeveloped. Maybe we can do some things that will help that organize and you can do this in a non-pejorative way you know it's um we get a lot of feedback from individuals about how uh it doesn't feel blaming or shaming or stigmatizing to look at a picture and say this is the way we you appear to be organized right now and here's the good news all of these things you know we we have ideas about how to make all these things improve and so yes, we do use it with an adult population, and we're we're sometime in the next week or so we're going to have a specialized version that we've been developing uh, for the infant and early childhood population. We do use it with that population, but the 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 metric itself is not does not have enough discriminative capability for really young kids. So we now have a version that's going to be for uh, very young children. Anyway, I'm I I better go because I. <laughs> You're right. I'm always late. I'm always late for what I'm supposed to do anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Jonah, thanks for popping in, buddy. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Would you uh, stay for a few minutes, the others? Uh, Kashmin and Zehra, are you with us? Uh, yes. Yeah. Could you uh, give some feedback about this meeting? I mean, uh, all of you, Rojda, Ramin, Zehra, Kashmin. Just a few uh, minutes, maybe. I think it was interesting. Uh, I like it. It's... Thank you. Uh, well, this model is uh, quite new to me, so I think it's quite a lot to digest in one session. Uh, but I think the, uh, I mean, everyone was like really uh, full on focused when uh, Professor was talking. So, um, yeah, probably we need a part two. My suggestion. Maybe uh, all of us, uh, similar to the other uh, people, hopefully will uh, watch this. 
can go over the uh, recorded version and uh, try to uh, digest, as you said. I think that the topic was quite complicated and a new thing in development. Uh, but uh, like uh, I lost focus a lot of time because it was quite, uh, the professor was trying to squeeze uh, a, a complicated thing in a short span of time. So it was like, practically impossible to uh, say all of the things in a single session and I will agree with Ramin that we do need a part two to uh, kind of spread things out and make it more understandable. That's why it was called introduction to. So uh, it's indeed and he said it needs 140 hours uh, distributed to a year so it's maybe if we go to the beginning of this session, we can try to reach the documents he has uh, provided. Rojda, last words from you, if you like. Um, for me, the problem was same. Uh, I couldn't focus all the time. It was very long. Um, I think it was challenging for me to listen or, and uh, maybe we can create a new uh, for the for the coming uh, meetings of course we can maybe um, if we plan something like that uh, the the slides will be focusing on only the main ideas maybe uh, and the details will come with the questions later i don't know maybe he planned something like this. I know he has many things in his life, his mind, uh, because he's working for working on it. But yeah, maybe uh, it is too much for for an introduction. Thank you. Uh, I think you have put some links. Uh... Yeah, I, I've just shared the link to uh, the handouts, the PDFs that. Uh... Professor Perry shared at the beginning of his lecture. So yeah, I managed to get it. So yeah, I think we can Thank have you. a look and try to help us digest uh, some of the things. Okay, dear friends, thank you for being with us. I was afraid we would be only two of us, but I'm glad uh, we were more than two. Uh, of course, these uh, Kashmir and Zehra, and also for some time, uh, there was also another friend, Moise, I think. Uh, they don't appear in YouTube, but anyhow, uh, thank you for being together. Have a good day. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. So pleased to see you, uh, Ramin. Yep, pleased to see you too. And it's uh, nice for me to see you with a smiling face. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you have run over uh, several difficulties and you are much better now. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Great. Best wishes. You too.